So good evening, afternoon, morning, depending on where you are, everyone. My name is Sydney Yeager, and I'm the Public Programs Coordinator at the Museum of Jewish Heritage, a living memorial to the Holocaust. Um, it's my pleasure to welcome you to today's History of Antisemitism program on Leo Frank. Here at the museum, we are dedicated to the crucial mission of educating our diverse community about Jewish life and heritage before, during, and after the Holocaust. As part of that mission, our programs illuminate the stories of survivors, broader histories of hate and anti-Semitism, stories of resistance against injustice, and more. Thank you so much for joining us today virtually. We hope you'll visit the museum in person if you're able to see our current exhibitions and join us in October for the opening of Courage to Act, Rescue in Denmark, the museum's first exhibition for visitors ages nine and up. You can learn more on our website. Closed captions are available on today's program and instructions on how to turn captions on or off are posted in the chat. If you have questions for our speakers during the program, please put them in the Zoom Q&A box and we will get to as many as we can at the end of the hour. Um, before I introduce our panelists and moderator, I want to thank the William Bremen Jewish Heritage Museum for co-presenting today's program and for all their help with this program. Today, we are honored to be joined by Sandy Berman, Steve Oney, Eric L. Goldstein, and Matthew H. Bernstein. Sandy has a master's degree in history and archives from Case Western Reserve University and was the founding archivist of the Cleveland Jewish Archives at the Western Reserve Historical Society. She is also the founding archivist of the William Bremen Jewish Heritage Museum, where she established the largest repository for Jewish historical research in the Southeast. As the archivist, as the archivist, Sandy spent years traveling to small towns across Georgia and Alabama documenting Jewish life. During her tenure at the Bremen, Sandy curated numerous exhibitions, including Zap, Pow, Bam, The Superhero, The Golden Age of Superhero Books, 1938 to 1950, Seeking Justice, The Leo Frank Case Revisited, and History with Chutzpah, Remarkable Stories of the Southern Jewish Experience. She's also the author of two books of historical fiction, Clara with a K and Whitewashed. Steve is the author of And the Dead Shall Rise, The Murder of Mary Fagan, and The Lynching of Leo Frank. The book received the American Bar Association Silver Gavel Award and the National Jewish Book Award. He is also the author of A Man's World, a collection of magazine articles drawn from his career writing for GQ, Esquire, Los Angeles, The Atlanta Journal and Constitution Magazine, Time, and other publications. He is presently working on a history of NPR for Simon & Schuster's Avid Reader Press. He was raised in Atlanta and educated at the University of Georgia and at Harvard, where he was a Neiman and a Shorenstein Fellow. He lives in Los Angeles with his wife, designer Madeline Stewart. Eric is Associate Professor of History and Jewish Studies at Emory University, where he directed the TAM Institute for Jewish Studies for a decade. He is the author of the prize-winning The Price of Whiteness, Jews, Race, and American Identity. American Identity, excuse me, and with Deborah R. Weiner on Middle Ground, A History of the Jews of Baltimore. From 2007 to 2012, he was the editor of the, of the quarterly scholarly journal, American Jewish History. Matthew is the Goodrich C. White Professor of Film and Media at Emory University, where he teaches courses on film history and criticism. He is the author of Screening the Lynching, the Leo Frank Case on Film and Television, and Walter Wanger, Hollywood Independent, a biography of a major producer in the classical era. He is the editor or co-editor of four anthologies on topics ranging from John Ford to film censorship and the author of numerous essays. He's a two-time recipient of the National Endowment for the Humanities Research Grants, as well as teaching and scholarship awards from the prestigious Society for Cinema and Media Studies. From 2005 to 2020, he served on the National Film Preservation Board, which advises the Librarian of Congress on matters of preservation, as well as films to be added to the National Film Registry. He is currently co-writing a history of the Columbia Pictures Studio and a study of Atlanta film culture in the segregated era. Thank you all so much for joining us today. And now I'm gonna hand things off to Matthew. Thank you, Sydney. Thank you so much for inviting each of us to participate in this panel on this very important, serious uh, topic. And I'll reiterate Sydney's thanks to these ace panelists she has gathered together to talk about the Leo Frank case. So we thought we would talk about the case specifically for a bit. We then consider it in the context of the early 1900s when it occurred and in the South. Uh, we also want to consider how it fits into the larger history of anti-Semitism in America before the Holocaust and after World War II. So we'll be continually broadening our perspectives on the case as we go. 
and we'll conclude with some observations about why it's important to know the case and uh, to study it and remember it uh, today. At that point, we will open our discussion up to you. And as Sydney said, you can post your uh, questions in the chat <clears throat> and we will get them. You can address them to specific panelists or to all of us. So let's get started. Um, Sandy, would you begin by just giving us a kind of pricey of the uh, Leo Frank case for people who may not be familiar with it and those who need a refresher? My pleasure. Um, again, thank you for asking me to be on the panel. Um, I am going to do my best to give you an abridged version of a very complex subject. It all began on April 26, 1913, when Mary Fagan, a 13-year-old girl from Marietta, decided to go to Atlanta to the Confederate Memorial Parade. While in town, she also wanted to go to the National Pencil Company, a Jewish-owned factory uh, where she was employed. Um, she wanted to pick up her pay envelope and ask about uh, whether or not the shipment of metal had come in because it was her job to put the metal tips on the, for the erasers. Once at the factory, she goes to the superintendent's office, Leo Frank. He is um, the nephew of one of the principal shareholders, Mo Moses Frank, to collect her pay and to ask about the metal. Leo Frank is the last person who admits to seeing Mary Fagan alive. Her body is found the next morning in the basement of the pencil, in the early morning hours of the next morning in the basement of the pencil factory by night watchman, Newt Lee. Um, Newt immediately calls the police. They come over to investigate. They uh, look at the crime scene. They discover two pieces of paper that are half hidden underneath the body. They are later called the murder notes. One of those notes points directly at a tall, dark, Black Negro, which is an accurate description of the night watchman, Newt Lee. The police decide to hold Newt Lee over for questioning. Next, the police decide, call the home of the Frank, call the Frank home, tell, them that, tell him that something tragic has happened at the factory, and then go to his home where they deliver the news that a 13-year-old girl had been murdered, murdered there. They then take him to the mortuary where, Leo, where Mary Fagan had been taken. He identifies the body as the little girl who visited him that day at the, at the pencil factory, and they then hold him for further questioning. Five days later, um, Jim Conley, who is the sweeper at the pencil factory, is seen by another employee washing out what looked like blood from a shirt. It's reported to the police, and Jim Conley is then picked up for questioning. At this point in time, they examine the murder notes to see who could have possibly penned them by seeing whose handwriting matches. It's obvious that it's the handwriting of Jim, of Jim Conley. Um, it's at this point that Jim starts to, by way of explanation, say that um, even though it's his handwriting and he penned the notes, it was Leo Frank that actually dictated them to him. Um, the police, for whatever reason, really hone in on Jim's story and believe him. He, he elaborates and, and begins to tell a, a story about Leo Frank often meeting young girls at the factory on Saturday to have his way with them. And on this particular day, um, something went terribly wrong and Mary Fagan was murdered by Leo, at the hands of Leo Frank. Jim um, defends himself by saying his only crime was to help Leo Frank dispose of the body by using the elevator, which becomes a, a really a very important point of interest um, much later in, in the case, but using the elevator to take the body down to the basement. Um, the police present um, the testimony to the grand jury and who then indict Leo Frank for the crime of murder, uh, murdering Mary Fagan. The trial begins at the end of July, July 28th of 1913, um, and it lasts about three and a half weeks. Um, during that uh, time, countless witnesses are brought to the witness stand, um, people who um, affirm Leo, Crank, Leo Frank's good character, others who 
say, disavow his good character, medical testimony, but everyone knows, the prosecution and the defense know that the case really rests on the testimony of Jim Conley, the sweeper. If Jim Conley is believed, then the prosecution will get a guilty verdict. If the, Jim Conley is not believed, if he is broken on the witness stand, then Leo Frank has a chance of being acquitted. Um, Jim Conley is not uh, broken on the witness stand. He, he is, stands up to an onslaught of questions by the defense attorney, Luther Rosser, a very well-known Atlanta attorney. And after Jim testifies, it doesn't, it, the trial is pretty much over and it only takes then the, the all-male white jury an hour and 45 minutes to reach a guilty verdict. Um, once Julio is found guilty, um, he is put back in the, in the tower the, um, above the Fulton County Courthouse, the police department. It was what they called the jail. And that's where he stays for the next two years while the appeals work their way through the courts. The um, defense attorneys mount multiple appeals that go all the way to the Supreme Court. That last appeal is ultimately denied. Um, Leo's only chance rests with the Pardon and Parole Board and then with the governor. Uh, they present their case to the Pardons and Parole Board, hoping that they will um, commute his sentence to, from death to life in prison. They refuse to do so. It now rests in the hands of Governor John Slayton. Um, but the governor goes through all of the evidence for the next um, couple of weeks. He goes to the factory. He he, he really studies the case. Um, and at the end of that, in all good conscience, he feels that he cannot um, he, he cannot sentence Leo Frank to death by hanging. He, he feels that the sentence needs to be commuted from death to life in prison, that there's just not enough evidence to support a death sentence. Um, the night before the, sentence, the announcement of the commutation, um, that the governor is worried about uh, a mob scene, the crowds, and Leo Frank is taken by train to the prison work farm in Milledgeville, Milledgeville Georgia. The governor had good reason to be worried. A mob, a mob is formed the next day after the announcement. They storm the governor's mansion, and it's the first time in any state's history that a sitting governor needs to call out the National Guard for his own protection. Um, Leo Frank then is. At the, at the prison farm, um, hoping, um, being visited by his wife often and hoping that somehow someday he will, he will be free and that new evidence will surface. Uh, unbeknownst to him, um, the leaders of Marietta, the, the community where Mary Fagan, Fagan hailed from, um, were planning to um, carry out the sentence that the they felt had been denied to them by the commutation. They wanted him to hang for the murder of Mary Fagan. And by leaders, I mean um, an attorneys, um, businessmen, a judge, a past Georgia governor. Um, these were the leaders of the community and they conspired with the prison and parole board to allow 25 armed men to drive to the prison farm on August 16th, 1915, where they kidnapped Leo Frank and drove him back to Marietta where he was then lynched. Um, the Jewish community, um, and we'll, I know we're gonna go into this a little more in more detail later, but the Jewish community lived in fear following the lynching. Um, they, they really um, went underground and they did very little in the way of pushing the police or the courts to try the per to find the perpetrators who lynched Leo Frank. It wasn't until 1982 when a man by the name, an individual by the name of Alonzo Mann, he was in his 80s at the time, walked into the offices of the Tennessean in, in Nashville and told a remarkable story about being an office boy in 1913 and seeing Jim Conley carrying the body of Mary Fagan. Um, he um, never told anybody because uh, even though he was a witness on the witness stand, his mother said, if they don't ask you, don't tell them anything. If they don't ask you that question. 
And so he kept this secret all these years and that gave the Jewish community of, of Atlanta, pushed them finally to do something about, about the injustice that they felt had been done to Leo Frank. And they launched a, um, an attempt to get a posthumous pardon. Um, in 1984, it was denied. They tried again in 1986. And um, Leo Frank was finally posthumously pardoned, but the state of Georgia did not address the question of guilt or innocence. They pardoned him only on the basis that the state failed to protect him. Thank you, Sandy, That's for summarizing, summarizing a very complex case in record time. Uh, as people can see, this case was, <clears throat> was a mix of factors and elements involving race relations, the situation of the Jews in Atlanta at the time, um, <clears throat> their gender issues involved, their class issues involved, and that Leo Frank was, you know, a member of the managerial class and the victim, and he was raised in Brooklyn, and the victim was a Southern-born uh, girl, you know, an, an innocent victim, and this really inflamed passions. Um, so there are many, many aspects of this case that are uh, fascinating, uh, almost better than fiction in a certain way. And, uh, but we wanna talk about some of the, the larger issues pertaining to the place of uh, Jewish Americans in this. And for this, I'm gonna turn to uh, Steve and, and just talk about the role of anti-Semitism in the Leo Frank case, because there is some debate about that. So I was wondering if you could just briefly tell us a bit about what are the different interpretations of the case in those terms? Well, in the, thank you, Matthew. In the aftermath of the case, uh, there were allegations that the crowd outside the courtroom shouted at the jurors, hang the Jew or we'll hang you. That demonstrably did not happen. No place is that in the record uh, in the daily newspaper accounts. Nonetheless, the atmosphere in the courtroom was poisonous. And Frank really had four strikes against him. He was an industrialist, he was a Yankee, he was a Jew. And while he was indicted for the murder of Mary Fagan, he was simultaneously in the public mind on trial as a sexual predator. Because as Sandy alluded, Jim Conley, the key witness against Frank, accused him of having seduced numerous women in the factory Moreover, he accused him of having a preference for oral sex instead of old-fashioned missionary sex, what in Georgia in 1913 would have been the capital offense of oral sodomy. And so Frank entered, or he, when the prosecution was finished with its case against Leo Frank, he stood accused of murder and sexual predation. As a consequence, the defense undertook a very risky move and decided to introduce Frank's good character into evidence. And tacitly, this was introducing Frank's Jewishness into evidence because most of the Southern Jewish community in Atlanta testified to Frank's good character. One Jewish witness after another came by to just say, he's a lovely man. The tactical error the defense made was that this allowed the prosecution to call in Sir Rebuttal young girls who worked at the factory to testify to Frank's bad character in a general sense. And by the rules of court, um, the defense, if they had cross-examined, would have opened themselves up to these girls specifying exactly what it was that Leo Frank had done, which bore the risk of some of these young women affirming what Jim Conley had said uh, was Frank's sexual preference. The, we've got to remember the National Pencil Company was a tinderbox of potential fire. It was a 170 member workforce, almost all of them teenage girls, a small managerial staff of mostly men with Leo Frank, the Cornell educated mechanical engineer, at the head of that staff. So there was just a lot of room for misunderstanding, debate, um, power struggles. 
it all turned against Frank. The You could sense if you were in the courtroom and reading about the trial, the dynamic of the court uh, had gone against him. And in the last minutes of the trial, the last days of the trial, the defense had Frank make an unsworn statement to his good character and to his general excellence as a manager. That was a disastrous move for the defense because Frank was not a very winning person. He was like a mechanical engineer, mechanical. So he ticked off these data points, talking with pride about the productivity and the accounting uh, improvements at the factory. He came across to a group of Southern white jurors who, whose families were you know, not really that removed from uh, the Scots-Irish original immigrants who established uh, the main population group of the white South. It had all gone terribly wrong for Leo Frank. And in the end, uh, Reuben Arnold, the number two chair defense lawyer, stood up and said, we've got to talk about what's really been unsaid here all along. Leo Frank would not have been tried for this crime if he weren't Jewish. This has been the unspoken, horrible truth of these proceedings, and we have to address it head on. Hugh Dorsey, the prosecutor, countered saying many of his best friends were Jews. He would never try a Jew uh, solely because of his religion. And in the end, uh, I don't think that washed. And, and Leo Frank was, as Sandy pointed out, quickly, quickly convicted. But the the fear of anti-Semitism hung over this. And a few days after Frank's conviction, David Marks, the rabbi at the Reform synagogue, the temple, got on a train, went to New York, and list, enlisted the leading lights of Southern Jewry to the cause of what he saw as a terrible persecution, not a prosecution, a persecution of this Jewish industrialist, Leo Frank. And from that point on, this was all about anti-Semitism. Just to follow up briefly, um, the uh, former populist, Tom Watson, had a role in fanning the flames. And was he uh, raising, uh, you know, anti-Jewish sentiment in the original trial, uh, maybe towards the end, or was it only after the trial and the appeals process? It was only was after the trial and appeals that Tom Watson got involved. And two yeah. things to keep in mind about this case, volatile as it was, it was confined largely as a subject of interest to Atlanta. There had only been two stories in the New York Times about the case until 1914, a year after the conviction. At that point, Adolph Ox, the publisher of the New York Times, took it and a Southern Jew who grew up in Knoxville, Tennessee, and felt himself to be incredibly familiar and sympathetic to Southern ways and mores. He took it on himself to create a call celeb about the Frank case and Tom Watson, the so-called Agrarian rebel who published a small weekly newspaper out of Thompson, Georgia, near Augusta, took it upon himself week after week to rebut the New York Times coverage. And in doing so, Watson used pretty virulent anti-Semitic language. He often didn't even refer to Leo Frank by name in the stories. He would just call him the lecherous Jew. That's very, very, very powerful and, and very influential and certainly fanning the flames that <clears throat> led to the mob violence that ended Leo Frank's life. Eric, <clears throat> can you help us understand the Southern uh, and American context of Leo Frank's trial and lynching um, and just sort of the status of anti-Semitism um, in, in the country at this time that could kind of be channeled into the Frank case? Sure, absolutely. Just, you know, to put it in a broader context, first of all, in the in terms of anti-Semitism, um, I think in all respects, in some ways, the Frank case is is exceptional when you think about the larger context of anti-Semitism in, in the United States, and yet it's also extremely helpful for thinking about anti-Semitism. Generally, uh, the, the type of extreme violence uh, against Jews that the Frank case represents what was not very typical of anti-Semitism in the United States. In fact, usually the Frank case is compared with some other cases like say the Bayless trial in Russia, the Dreyfus affair uh, uh, in France, and um, 
you know, the, those uh, other events happened in places where anti-Semitism was much more prevalent and much more a part of the of the political culture. And if anything, the United States in the modern period stands out as a place where there was where anti-Semitism was probably more mild uh, than in most parts of Europe. Um, that said, I think perhaps it's it's been overstated how little anti-Semitism there was in the United States and currently in the field of American Jewish history, especially in the light in light of the recent resurgence of anti-Semitism in the United States. A lot of historians are going back and reassessing and paying more attention to the history of anti-Semitism in the U.S. and that it wasn't a kind of exceptional place where anti-Semitism did not happen. That said, it was much more common both in Atlanta and other parts of the United States for, for there to be types of anti-Semitism such as social anti-Semitism, um, where Jews were restricted from clubs and, and you know, from educational institutions. Um, there was job discrimination against Jews. Um, there was also a kind of publicistic, you know, anti-Semitism of images of Jew, negative images of Jews in the press and in, in theater and in popular culture. Um, but, you know, specifically the type of violent anti-Semitism of physical attacks on Jews was much less common in the United States um, during this whole period. There, there were a couple of other incidents uh, that come to mind uh, in the period after the Civil War. Um, there was a murder of a Jew in, in Tennessee. Um, in um, during the 1890s, there were incidents called white capping, which where Jewish merchants were attacked and their stores were sometimes burned down. Um, of course, later we have some incidents like the murder of um, Goodman and Schwerner, the, the civil rights uh, workers. Um, you know, and in all of these cases, one could ask whether anti-Semitism was the primary motivation, but it probably on some level, you know, played some role. Um, but but anyway, my point is overall, the, the, the Frank case stands out as somewhat exceptional in terms of the level of violence. Um, and this is why, you know, when recently there's been violence against Jews, like with the Pittsburgh massacre, um, it, re it really stands out as unprecedented because there haven't been so many um, such incidents in U.S. history. Um, so some of the ways, though, that the Frank case do, you know, does sort of typify some larger patterns is um, at the core of, of the image of Leo Frank, uh, which Steve sort of referred to this a bit, um, there was a way in which the Jew as a, as a figure in American culture uh, was a stand-in for a lot of the uh, social problems, the, the social anxieties of American culture, particularly in the period in the early 20th century, I'd say up to World War II, when the United States was going through a lot of uh, traumatic uh, social and economic and political transformations. Um, and not because Jews were, were so marginal to society, but actually because they were a group that was in many ways involved in a lot of key institutions and, and they were sort of integrating into American culture. And yet they were different enough to be marked um, as a separate group. They often served as a scapegoat for a lot of uh, pressing, you know, deeper social problems in, in, in American culture. So, you know, especially in this Southern context of uh, an industrializing South at the turn of the century, Atlanta was probably one of the most industrializing cities in the American South. And it, it created a very, a lot of social trauma, um, displacement of, of people from a more rural setting, from, from a familiar economic pattern. Um, it it um, disoriented family life and, and so on. So the, the context of Mary Fagan, a young girl who would have more typically grown up on a farm outside of Atlanta and been in familiar surroundings and been under the watchful eye of her family and now has to go work uh, in a big city and, and apart from her family and so on. You know, that's just a, an example of the types of problems I'm talking about. And it, it was not uncommon in all sorts of ways for, for anti-Semitic stereotypes to play on the fact that Jews were a kind of symbol. Um, I've, in my work, I've called them a mirror of American life at this period, where a lot of these problems were projected onto Jews as a way of dispelling them from uh, you know, being the responsibility of, of the, the dominant society itself. Um, so that in that way, the Frank case is really reflective of some patterns in American anti-Semitism at the time. I would say also in terms of the timing of it, it's more, 
a portent of what of the anti-Semitism that would emerge in a much greater way in the interwar period than it was typical of the early 20th century. Um, the, the the period the, the period that we typically talk about as being the the you know in which anti-Semitism was the most significant is the period between the two world wars, um, partly because that was a period of a lot of of these difficult transitions, cultural, economic, um, you know, and social transitions of of migration, of urbanization, of the rise of certain forms of popular culture which disturb familiar patterns. It worsened during the Great Depression. Uh, and then, you know, the the sort of lead up to World War II itself was a very stressful time. And anti-Semitism in the United States continued to increase during this period and it peaked during World War II. Um, and then it precipitously declined after World War II. So the Frank case is at the very, very beginning. It's sort of an early um, case of, of what would become, you know, th that anti-Semitism would become much more common um, during the interwar period. Um, I'll, I'll save the, the discussion of the Southern environment for a little later when we're going to talk about regionalism, but I would say that anti-Semitism was different in different parts of the country, and I think there are some factors that are very particular to the South, um, and that anti-Semitism itself worked in a kind of what I would call, uh, it was sort of a conundrum where it worked in um, in a way that, did, that did, had some inconsistencies, where a lot of people, if you talk to them who grew up in the South, they will frequently say they never experienced any anti-Semitism, and yet you have individual cases of, of severe anti-Semitism, and so it's interesting to think about how those two things could both be true. Um, but I just want to, in closing my comments here, I want to say something about lynching and put this in the larger history of lynching, which is to say also that the Leo Frank case is, is ex somewhat exceptional in the history of lynching in that most lynchings in the United States were directed uh, toward people of color, most specifically African-Americans. Um, I looked up some statistics and uh, lynchings were very, very common in the United States, especially after 1889. They, they stopped being a major phenomenon in the 40s, but they were it already declined in the 30s. But in the decade in which Frank was lynched, um, there was approximately one lynching every five days, and 90% of those lynched were African Americans. And it, it's a thought that during this entire period, from about 1889 to the, to the mid-40s, um, at least 4,000 African-American men, women, and children were killed either in lynchings or in some kind of a mob violence situation. And it was exceedingly, exceedingly rare for Jews to experience that, as I said before, that kind of um, viol you know, violence motivated by anti-Semitism. And there may be one or two other Jews during a long sweep of history that that may have you know been killed in a kind of mob violence or lynching situation, but you know Leo Frank is is fairly exceptional in that regard. Now, I don't think that in and of itself makes the case any less sig historically significant either for Jewish history or for U.S. or Atlanta history. In fact, the case itself has been described as one of the most important events in Atlanta, in, in the political and legal and, and social history of the city of Atlanta and of the South of the period. Um, so, you know, I think despite the fact that it, it this situation wasn't repeated many times over, um, you know, the, it's of great importance and it can still teach us a lot about the larger, you know, factors that went into it. Um, I think I'll I'll leave it at that for now. Well, that's great. That's <clears throat> thank you so much, Eric, for <clears throat> providing all these different ways of thinking about the context of the case and uh, anti-Semitism in America in general. General, I'm going to go ahead and uh, skip to just having all asking all the panelists uh, a question or two. I mean, the time is galloping by. There's so much to say about this case. Um, we've alluded to it in some of your remarks already about um, <clears throat> the tinderbox, as Steve put it, at the factory, but also surrounding the case in terms of race and class and gender and sectionalism are partic all kind of mixed in. Um, and I guess I would um, want to focus in on, on the race issue 
of all of these because we haven't really talked about this. This is a jury that believed the uh, testimony of the fat black factory sweeper over anyone else who would testify on behalf of Leo Frank. And um, just kind of talking about how, you know, and Steve talks about all these strikes against Leo Frank, the fact that a Southern white jury only takes an hour and 40 minutes, as Sandy was saying, to believe the testimony of a black factory sweeper uh, as kind of the conclusive or or glue tying together all the state's evidence against Frank. How does that even happen? Why does that happen? And what, what does it say about race relations in Atlanta and the, or and possibly the South at the time? So any one of you who want to jump in? And... I would jump in quickly and say that traditionally in the South, race trumped class. Race was always the winning hand. And that's why there's really no labor union movement in the South. That's why you can't get up any kind of argument from the poor white against the overlord, because the overlord and the poor white workers share mastery over the black man. But there was an inflection point happening in the teens where for the first time, due to the industrialization of the South, class was becoming more important than race. And Tom Watson was really the first person to articulate this as a congressman in the 1890s. He would appear on podiums with integrated uh, groups, uh, black ministers, black politicians would be up there sharing equal billing with him. And he said something uh, very profound about uh, what kept blacks and poor whites apart. He said, you are kept apart that you may be separately fleeced of your earnings. Race antagonism perpetuates a monetary system which enslaves you both. And that's, I think, why a all-white jury could be sitting in a courtroom in Fulton County, Georgia, and come to believe a Black man's testimony over the testimony of an Ivy League-educated Jewish industrialist. So there was just a sense, and very dangerous to the white ruling class, uh, which is why the white ruling class so despised Tom Watson, there was a sense that things were going to get out of hand and the class resentment and class struggle. Um, in fact, Watson would sometimes refer to his followers after the Frank case as uh, the redneck Bolsheviki. And so there was a, a sense that um, class was more important than race. And that played into the Frank case. I'd also like to add that um... The, the jurors, they felt a more of a, a connection with Jim Conley in a sense. They felt they understood Jim Conley or his the type of man Jim Conley was better than they understood the type of man Leo Frank was. Um, and when he couldn't be broken on the witness stand, it was it 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 was a an affirmation of the fact that that African Americans were too, too dumb to be able to make up such an elaborate story. And so um, he had to be telling the truth. And so I think that all played into it with um, also on the other side, you know, Reuben Arnold, you know, makes a statement that, you know, African Americans are, are known liars. And so Jim, Jim had to be lying. So all of these preconceived notions and, and how they, all played into why um, Frank was ultimately convicted. Very briefly, it's an interesting point. I'll sometimes talk to black people about the Leo Frank case and they'll say, why are you paying so much attention? And isn't this evidence of racism against Jim Conley? And I will say, forget about Jim Conley's moral character. This is not racist to believe that Jim Conley is guilty. It actually is a compliment to Jim Conley's intelligence that he could have fabricated such a complicated story and then sold it to an all white jury. Jim Conley may have been the smartest guy in the courtroom, or at least he was the cleverest. So it, it was a, and Jim also knew he was in a lot of danger and that he had to spin a story that would stick with that white working class. Plus Jim Conley was a great entertainer. He was just a colorful figure who made friends and one over a skeptical jury. 
Yeah, I think one of the attorneys uh, years later said he had been in the courts. You know, he'd been brought up on charges. He's probably jailed a few times. So he knew his way around the court system um, and could manipulate it in that way. Eric, were you going to? Yeah, I was going to say, you know, I think also it's really important to think about, especially in the American context, to think about how anti-Semitism fits into larger issues and patterns of American racism. And rather it, it being a question of like whether, you know, which one was more important, anti-Semitism or say anti-Black racism, it's really interesting to think about how these two things have worked in concert. And, and the, on the one hand, they've been different from one another. They, they sometimes stem from different social and, and cultural, um, you know, causes. And yet at the same time, they, they are sort of interrelated and they have often supported one another. Um, in the South, the, the, the concept of a black-white divide, of a racial hierarchy organized around color had been, you know, a longstanding tool of social control. And for the dominant white culture, it was a, it was a way of um, thinking of themselves as superior, of, of bolstering their, their sense of self-confidence, especially in times of, of social turmoil. And it was also a, way, a strategy to allay class divisions and things that might otherwise disrupt society. Um, and it often seems that anti-Semitism emerges in U.S. history at moments where um, there is some kind of internal turmoil, and for whatever reason, that traditional way of thinking and ordering society fails or doesn't work in a particular context. So I think it's interesting to think about the Frank case as a moment, you know, in this period of industrialization, in this period where, you know, if you think about Mary Fagan as a, as a figure uh, that perhaps represented uh, a threat to the the sense of white superiority of the ability of you know in the classic stereotypes of the time of the ability of white men to care for their daughters and wives and and so on and have a certain authority and this this process was threatening that traditional way of life um and it's so you can see in that moment uh in, in moments like that often um this these these uh opinion makers and so will will look inward and try to find somebody within white society to to blame for these problems uh, because the traditional way of of ordering society and thinking of these groups isn't working uh, isn't bolstering that that traditional sense of self-confidence and superiority so in that way you can think of um you know it, this made sense in that moment um and um it's interesting that you know after this it's not like um what you know white supremacy the whole idea of white supremacy didn't vanish but but you can see in ways in which the the frank case sort of allowed it to continue on and and be, you know remain a a major factor in 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 southern life and southern culture uh, moving on and we, we often talk about the kkk arising at, you know in the wake of this um it, you know you can see that as as having to do with the jews on some level uh, but i think e even more importantly it was a reassertion of a of the traditional um, you know, appeal to to white supremacy, um, that, you know, that came out of this case. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Excellent points. Um, <clears throat> well, we had much more we wanted to talk about, but um, I see there are a bunch of questions, some of which raise some of the issues we had in mind. So at this point, uh, let's, let's go to uh, some of these questions. I'll read them off. Um, um, have any of you seen the musical parade, either most recently on Broadway or in the past? If so, to what degree do you think it serves well the history of Leo Frank's story? I saw it just recently in New York. Um, it was um, it was a wonderful, wonderful show, and I think they I think you know they did a very good job of of telling the story. Um, you know, I, I know some of the minutiae of the Frank case, so I, I was listening to a couple of things that weren't, you know, some names that had been changed and things like that. But basically, anything that I can get something like the Frank case out to a general audience, anything like that is, I think, good, because we need to have it it being out there in, in, in the world and in, in, in the in, not just to scholars or academics or the Jewish community that is interested in the Frank case, but to the population at large. And I was listening to some of the comments while I was sitting in the theater and just, 
hearing about, oh, I didn't know anything about this. I, they just went to see parade and, um, and they were just amazed by, by this, by what had happened to, to him. Anyone else have thoughts? I would just want to say I, I haven't seen the most recent production, but I saw the original version of Parade that w appeared about 25 years ago. Um, and I think it's just interesting that my, my recollection is at the time it did not make as big of an impact as this yeah. this version yes. has. Um, and I think that can only be credited to the fact that anti-Semitism is much more of a, of a factor in, in our lives and our society right now. Um, so, you know, I think it's just interesting how, um, you know, our, the way that we revisit the past and pay attention to things is filtered through, through you know, contemporary events and concerns. And you have testimony to that. Uh, the uh, actor who plays Lucille Frank, I'm forgetting her name, she published a very moving op-ed in the New York Times about how she really didn't know much about the Frank case and how actually performing in this play had opened her eyes to reality of anti-Semitism and the history and the case. So, you know, it's interesting. Um, <clears throat> the the writer of the book, I'm sorry, his name is escaping me at the moment. Alfred Urey. Alfred Urey, thank you. You know, he originally talked about how he thought the Leo Frank case should be an opera. Um, and I think they've tried to get that kind of operatic quality into the show. And I think the music, I saw it like Eric 20 years ago or so, I thought the music was was marvelous in getting that. They have a clash of perspectives, very imaginatively staged. So, um, and I'll, I'll say also, because this is something I wrote a book about, there are a couple of moving image treatments of the Frank case, uh, kind of obscure, but very powerful Warner Brothers film from 1937 called They Won't Forget. That's about the Frank case, although it takes the anti-Semitism anti anti element out. There was a two part mini series with Jack uh, Lemon as Governor Slayton called the um, murder of Mary Fagan. Um, these are these are worth checking out. They're really interesting and everybody did their research. So, um, you know, take a look. They're much easier to find now than they were when I wrote my book. Another question, what was the role of the KKK before, during and after the case? <clears throat> Eric, do you want to speak to that? Well, I think Steve or, and or Sandy might know more about during the case. Um, uh, briefly, the, the KKK did not exist during the Leo Frank case. The original Klan founded by Nathan Bedford Forrest disbanded when home rule was restored to the South and the Union Army withdrew and uh, Southern courts and Southern voting systems were reestablished. So for 50 years, there was no KKK per se. There were certainly strong sentiments and a romanticization of it. The summer of the lynching of Leo Frank, uh, a veteran lodge member named Colonel William Simmons, I don't think he was a real colonel, was in Atlanta, was in a car wreck uh, while he was recovering. He had a vision of ghost riders in the sky, and he organized the first meeting of the modern Ku Klux Klan at Top Stone Mountain on Thanksgiving Eve of 1915 about two and a half months after the Frank lynching. So that was the start of the modern Ku Klux Klan. And apparently there were three members of the Frank Lynch party who were at this cross burning. That's also apparently the first cross burning. The Klan adopted a lot of Scottish ritual uh, for its uh, symbolic uh, and dramatic import. So the Klan per se had no relationship to the lynching of Leo Frank, but the lynching of Leo Frank had a relationship to the revival of the Ku Klux Klan. And this is a way in which the the Frank case, as I said, was a kind of portent of things that happened later in the in the interwar period, and the KKK becomes a very uh, important organization and and a na nationwide organization in that period. Um, we usually associate it as being kind of a Southern organization, but it existed all over the country. It existed in major cities, in urban areas, in the Northwest. It was very prominent in Indiana, for, uh, as an example. Um, and something else I want to mention is, you know, we often have the view of uh, Klansmen as kind of you know, marginal people, uh, you know, lawless people and so on, which, you know, they certainly were in terms of violence. But my point is that 
a, a lot of historiography about the Klan points out that many of the people involved in it were prominent individuals in their community. They were people who otherwise might be seen as mainstream, you know, members of mainstream society. And I think that's, you know, worth noting and, and you know, as a kind of cautionary tale when we think about these movements that we shouldn't just think that they're kind of uh, marginal and, and only the, the people on the margins of societies are attracted to them. And I think, you know, that's something really noteworthy about the Frank case as well as, as Steve's work has particularly uh, shown that, you know, the people involved in the lynching of Leo Frank were likewise not just kind of marginal people. They were people who were very prominent in Atlanta and Georgia in their communities. Um, and that's, you know, kind of an important thing to take away from this history. Absolutely. Um, another question, um, do you, do we all believe that Leo Frank was innocent? Who wants to start? Sandy? I, I, you know, in all of my research, and I remember asking Steve the same question many years ago, um, everything I believe and, and everything that I have researched and all, everything that I have read, and, and I believe Leo Frank was 99.9% .9 innocent. I, I, I believe that Jim Conley actually uh, murdered Mary Fagan and uh, Leo Frank was not guilty. I mean, there are interesting ways to look at it. I basically agree with Sandy, but the motivation for the killing is interesting. Um, the prosecution believed that Murray Fagan was killed as part of a sex crime. The defense argued that this was a robbery gone wrong and that Jim Conley had waylaid Mary Fagan when she left the pencil factory office with her pay, hit her over the head, took her money, and then he had to kill her to uh, get rid of someone who was going to testify against him. So I think those questions are worth factoring in. Both Jim Conley and Leo Frank had the opportunity to murder Mary Fagan. And depending on your perspective, they might each have had a motive. Uh, it's hard to explain away all the females who testified against Leo Frank, both at the trial and at the coroner's inquest. Was this a moment of mass delusion uh, egged on in a hyped up culture? Or was there some grain of truth to what they were saying? The... But Jim Conley was in much closer proximity to her in the basement. And one thing we haven't talked about really, the murder notes, which are the key evidence in this case, are undoubtedly the product of Jim Conley's mind. He not just wrote them down, he composed them. And those notes by their very language point to the crime taking place, not as the prosecution argued outside Leo Frank's office, but down here in the dark, in the basement, and unconsciously, those notes lay the crime at Jim Conley's feet. Uh, the author of the notes was the author of the murder. That's my way of arguing for Leo Frank's innocence. I also think that, the, you know, originally, I think Conley, in writing the notes, wanted to point the police toward Newt Lee. I mean, that was his, you know, you know, he didn't, at, the, at that moment, I don't think he thought about it being pinned on Leo Frank. I think he wanted to exonerate himself and pin it on somebody else. And so he described Newt Lee in one of the murder notes. Right. The history of the cross-examinations of Conley by the police, that's an interesting progression as you can see Jim's story begun, begin to conform with the prosecution and the police theory. So Jim realized which way the wind was blowing, and he adapted his testimony to suit the police theory of the crime. Do uh, any of us have a, have a question about what the notes actually said? I guess it's best to just summarize. Uh, I don't have an exact copy of what the notes said, but it's, um, I don't know if somebody... Well, to paraphrase that long, tall, black... Negro did this. I went to make water. I write while he play with me. That long, tall black Negro did by his self. There's no punctuation, uh, very few, if any, capital letters, but there are some key grammatic moments. The 
correct use of the word did, uh, relatively decent grammar throughout the notes. And the prosecution would argue that the notes were written by someone who never used those words correctly. And Jim Connolly's lawyer, who's a fascinating character who comes into this case in the end, argued, uh, having looked at all of Jim Connolly's written and oral utterances that he could discover, that Jim always used the word did correctly. So uh, it's, but someone should do a master study of the notes. I don't think they've ever been submitted to a real linguistic study. Matthew, I just want to say that um, there's also a, a reason to maybe push beyond the, the question of guilt and innocence, because, you know, al although there does seem to be a, a consensus among many that Frank was probably innocent, um, at the end of the day, the history of lynching is not just about the, the question of innocence. In other words, it's a tragedy that many people that were innocent were, were lynched. Um, but lynching is, was also a tragedy just because it was a, an extra legal type of murder uh, in which people, whether they were guilty or innocent, did not get the, the benefit of a fair trial. Right. Um, and it became about their their racial status or their religious status or whatever. So, you know, there's a way in which the, 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 the question of guilt and innocence is maybe not the most central issue in, in the historical legacy of the Frank case and of other lynchings. in the United That's States. an excellent point. Very excellent. Thank you. Well, for... the, the Frank lynching was a spectacle, and it was probably the most spectacular lynching in the history of Southern lynchings in that Leo Frank was abducted from the state prison, which was a very difficult act to carry out. And then he was transported in the dead of night over dirt roads in a caravan of seven or eight Model T-like cars from Milledgeville, the site of the state prison, back to Marietta, by a circuitous route and lynched at dawn the next day. And we can talk about who did it and uh, all the strings that had to be pulled, but after it was all over, what you're left with is that no one is safe. You can go into the state prison and get someone out and then you can disappear. And no one was obviously tried for the Frank lynching and uh, it, it was a it was a perfect crime if if you really look at it it was well conceived and expertly carried out and dispassionately so it was very methodical right i mean i think a lot of yeah it was not you hear the phrase lynch mob this was not a lynch mob this was more a military expedition that uh had commanders and um you know a chain of command and they got him they lynched him and then they took off. Yeah. So we are rapidly coming to the end of the and hour. I wanted to I, add that I, oh, sorry. Go ahead, Sandy. I just wanted to say that because of that, because it was this conspiracy, they were able to take him out of the prison. It played into the fears that permeated the Jewish community. I mean, the, the Jewish community in Atlanta was traumatized by this event. Some, some moved away never to return. Some bought weapons. Uh, but and then it became a subject that was never spoken about, and so I, I know we don't have any more time. But I, I, it was such a defining moment in Atlanta Jewish history, and really Southern Jewish history, and even national Jewish history. But but it affected the Jewish community in Atlanta to such an extent um, that it can't be minimized. What what this one particular event did to their sense of self for a community that. It, at one time felt very well accepted by the greater community. Yeah, thank you for for making that point. It truly was a traumatic event for the Jewish community and the Jewish in Atlanta and the country at large. So I had one more question for the panel before we turn things back to, to Sydney. And that is, uh, would love to hear your thoughts on why it's important for us to remember and understand the Leo Frank case, particularly now in this moment, 2023. <laughs> I welcome your thoughts on this. Well, uh, I'll jump in. Um, I mean, I think, as I said before, the reason I think the play is getting so much uh, attention is because of the reemergence, the 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 you know of anti-Semitism as an as an important factor in in American culture. 
Um, so I think always in those cases, it's interesting to look back and, and appreciate the fact that there is a history. This isn't just something that's um, emerged, you know, out of nothing, that, that there is a longer history, that anti-Semitism does emerge at particular times and, and places and, and under certain circumstances in U.S. history. And so I think, you know, looking back can help us better understand uh, what's happening, you know, today. And I, I won't go into detail for the time, but just to, to also say that I think in a, in a similar way that I mentioned that you can look at the Frank case and tie it to and understand it in relationship to other forms of racism, uh, anti-Black racism at the time in, in the South, um, that today you can also see connections and ways in which uh, anti-Semitism is, is bound up with white nationalism, um, and, you know, all one had to do was see what happened in Charlottesville, for example, to see how uh, those two things are sort of intertwined, that they're, that they're pushed forward by the same groups. Um, although they're not exactly the same, they do, they sort of rely on one another and, and animate one another. Um, and I think that's an important connection that the Frank case provides as well. No, very well said. Sandy, would you, would you like to comment on this? I think by studying the Frank case, we have a better understanding of what it what it, really what Eric said, reiterate what he said about understanding what is happening today. Um, we can look at the Frank case as as a as as, as just a, a, a horrible incident of anti-Semitism um, that that really changed um, how a community thought about itself. And I think that's something that we always have to remember about. Uh, you know, what happened didn't just happen to him, it happened to an entire people. And I think it's the same with what happened at the Pittsburgh, it, what happened at Pittsburgh, the tragedy at the Pittsburgh synagogue, it didn't just happen, I mean, it happened to Jews throughout this the country, we all felt that fear. And I think that that's what happened with the Frank case. It was a fear that everybody started to feel. Yeah. Steve? It focused on Jews, but it transcended faith. And if you think about it, I'm going to mention two points that are very similar to today. One, the battle over the truth about what happened to Mary Fagan took place between the mainstream media and the blogosphere, if you will, and social media. And the New York Times and the big northern newspapers, the enterprises that represent uh, great news tradition pretty much argued in Leo Frank's favor and presented one view of the facts. Tom Watson and others mounted a counter narrative to the point where Watson reported in his Jeffersonian that Frank confessed to murdering Mary Fagan. And the disparity between these realities or between one reality and one fantasy was so great that people had different versions of the truth. So that is well worth thinking about. And, you know, my theory has always been that demagoguery is the gateway drug to anti-Semitism, that get, demagoguery is where things start. And one should be careful about being truthful uh, in life. Two, the, Sandy started to mention this in her presses, but the night that Governor Slayton commuted Leo Frank and he was driven by train to Milledgeville, Atlanta awakened the next day, not just to an assault on Slayton's mansion, but a mob stormed into the state capitol, took over the rotunda, the punching out police officers, and then members of the same mob, 4,000 strong, marched out of downtown Atlanta up to Buckhead, where Slayton lived at his country place, uh, not the governor's mansion of today, but he had an actual working farm up there. And he had to call out the National Guard to save his life. So the things got out of hand very fast. And uh, the, the Frank lynching and the revolt against the commutation of Frank's sentence was really an attack on, on government, on, on what we consider to be society. Yeah. Uh not unlike something we've seen recently in the last few years. <clears throat> so thank you for those comments. I think it also points up that, uh, as uh, others have said, perhaps Deborah Lipset, and I'm sure Eric has 
talked about this, that anti-Semitism is always present. It's always under, it may be underground or close to the ground, and it can be activated at various moments as it is being activated now. So with that, I'm going to turn the program back to Sydney. I want to thank the panelists for their excellent comments and observations. This was just a very rich, rich conversation about a, a really important topic. Sydney? Thank you, Matthew. Thank you, Matthew. Yeah, I want to echo what Matthew said um, and my thanks to each of our panelists. And also thank you so much to you, Matthew, for leading this really in-depth conversation. I know it's really hard to tell the story in an hour. Um, and I would encourage all of you who are watching to um, check out the many books and resources that were mentioned throughout and um, Steve's excellent book, Eric's books. Um, there's yeah many, many resources. Um, and I also wanna thank the Bremen for, again, for helping uh, to bring this all together. Um, so yes, uh, you can, uh, and you can find all of their books on our website as well. So I would, uh, highly recommend going to check that out. Um, so thank you all, uh, for joining us. Um, if you enjoyed today's program, we hope you'll consider making a donation to support the museum at mghnyc.org support, and also joining us for our upcoming programs, which you can find on our website.